I'm John McQuay with 8541 Tactical, and this is the first installment of our Mega Arms Ma 10 build. Now, we've done a Ma 10 build in the past, but this one is a little bit different. The previous Ma 10 build was more of a DM type rifle. We used a Mega Arms monolithic receiver set and we built up a 16 inch 308. The whole purpose of that was to build up a rifle that you could either take out to the field, a truck gun, something you could compete in DM matches with, or something that an individual officer could use as a designated marksman rifle should his department allow that kind of thing. Well, this time we decided to take a little bit different track on things. We wanted to build up a pure match rifle, something that you'd take out to a precision rifle series type match and something that hopefully we'll be able to run with the bolt guns. Now to that end, we've got a couple of components we're gonna cover here real quick in the initial installment and let you guys know what we have coming up. Uh, this is just a broad overview of the type of rifle that we're going to try to put together here and then we're going to do individual installments on each of the components as we put these together. Now first of all we have the Mega Arms Megalithic receiver set here. Now, this is the heart of our setup and we really want to thank Mega Arms for sending this over to us. Now, the last Mega Arms Ma 10 build that we did was on a monolithic receiver set. Uh, since then, Mega Arms has gone through a couple of design changes. The last was the Mega Arms MKM. When they discontinued the monolithic receiver set, they started off with the MKM. Now, with the MKM, there was a key mod type tube that attached onto a shortened receiver and it bolted together. So there were actually two separate pieces and that rifle would build up very similar to a standard AR-15 where you just simply remove the rail system to install the barrel and then put the rail system back on once you're done installing the barrel and the gas system. Well we've gone forward and this design is called the megalithic receiver set and is really a whole lot closer to the original monolithic receiver set. There are a couple of little changes to it though. First of all, you'll notice that we do not have Picatinny rails on the side or on the bottom. Instead, those have been replaced by key mod interfaces and they basically allow you to put accessories wherever you want to put accessories. But the really nice thing is, it's slick when you don't have accessories installed. For those of us that shoot matches, this means that we don't have to worry about Picatinny rail getting dinged up or digging into barricades or obstacles or tearing up gear for shooting across packs and that kind of thing. It's also just really a whole lot nicer to put your hand on a bare key mod interface than it is to put your hand on a Picatinny rail system. It tends to kind of grade and dig in after a little while. So that is a really nice change. Now one feature on the megalithic receiver set that is very different from the monolithic receiver set is this neat little bubble level set in here. Now normally you would have a continuous top rail, it would be one piece. Now while the entire receiver set here, or the entire upper receiver here is made from one piece of aluminum, they decided to break up the continuous top rail by the inclusion of this little bubble level. The bubble level is a really cool deal because when you're in position, you can pop this guy out and you should be able to see it with your support side eye. Now, obviously this is gonna be dependent upon what kind of scope mount you put in here because if you put something that's got great big huge levers or blocks hanging off the side, it may obscure the bubble level. But if you put a reasonable set of rings or mount on here, then you should be able to see the bubble level just fine and that can be a great added advantage for precision rifle shooters that are shooting on uneven terrain. It really allows you to ensure that that rifle is leveled out uh, so that you get the most out of your ballistics downrange and you don't have the bullet arcing off to one side or the other. The bubble level is a really well thought out feature because when you don't want to use it, you keep it closed up and it's not in the way. It's not going to get caught. It's not going to get torn off. If you are a left-handed shooter, then you can remove these two screws. You can flip the bubble level 180 degrees and you can drop it in on the opposite side and you can use it with your support side eye as a left-handed shooter. So it was really nice that Mega Arms was thinking and made it so you can switch it to either side. Now, because the bubble level is nice and low profile, it doesn't come up any higher than the rest of the rail. So if you run into a situation where you need to mount your scope rings further forward or your mount extends over that area, then you should be good to go unless it comes down over the sides. 
And when it's all said and done, if the bubble level really gets in the way, again, it's two screws, you pop those out and off it goes and you don't even have to worry about it. So really nice feature. Mega Arms also changed up the sling mounting points. These are steel sling mounting points now and they're anti-rotation QD sockets. So when you stick your QD sling swivel in there, it won't rotate. It will lock into one of the positions and you don't have to worry about your sling getting wrapped up. The rest of the receiver going back is pretty much the same as the previous monolithic, the MKM, and now the megalithic. The lower receiver is a somewhat ambidextrous affair. You have the ambidextrous bolt release, and you get the ping pong paddle installed already on the left-hand side, and the right-hand bolt release on the right-hand side. And the set also comes with the takedown pins already installed. So you don't have to worry about that. Basically for your lower parts kit, you need a mag release, you're gonna need a selector lever and a fire control group. And that's it as far as the things that you have to install. The bolt release, both the ping pong paddle on this side and the ambidextrous release on this side are held in by set screws instead of roll pins. So should you need to remove them, it's a whole lot easier to get them out than it is to try to drive those punches out the opposite direction. It also affords for a much cleaner looking install. So really nice features there. Now the rear takedown pin on most AR-15s, the spring and detent that holds the rear takedown pin in comes in through the receiver extension area, comes in through the back of the receiver. Uh, Mega Arms changed theirs up a little bit and this has been all the way back to the megalithic build that we did and that spring and detent goes in from the bottom, from the pistol grip side, and it has an Allen screw in there to hold everything in. So when you get it out of the box, you don't have to worry about that falling out and getting lost. It's already held in there, it's captured, it's not going anywhere. Now the selector lever, detent, and spring, that still goes in just like it does on an AR-15, and it's held in place when you put your pistol grip on. The receiver set also comes with a Mega Arms charging handle. So again, another added thing that you don't have to buy. And they also include a nice little section of Picatinny rail. So you don't have to go out and buy key mod accessories right away if you want to mount your bipod or anything else. You already have one section of Picatinny rail that you can mount wherever you want it. Uh, most of our viewers, I would wager, are going to mount it in the 6 o'clock position so that you can get your bipod on there. But really the sky's the limit, you can put it wherever you want. And of course the rail system will accept any other standard key mod accessories. In addition to the rail system, Mega Arms also includes their proprietary barrel nut and also barrel nut wrench. Whereas the MKM setup, you could take the rail system off to go ahead and install your barrel just like you would on a standard AR-15. With the old monolithic and the new megalithic, you cannot do that. You need something to get down in there to be able to index the barrel nut and tighten it down. And it has to be a fairly rigid tool. So Mega Arms was nice enough to include their own proprietary barrel nut wrench and is a really beefy tool that allows you to get down in there, attach a torque wrench to it, and snug that barrel down without any problem at all. Again, a lot of companies would go ahead and include that as an extra expense. Mega Arms includes it free of charge with the receiver set, so very nice. Overall, that is the basics of the receiver, and we'll touch on some of the individual parts again as we go forward and as we start to put the different parts together. Now let's talk about the barrel that we're gonna use here real quick. The barrel that we selected for this build is a 6.5 Creedmoor barrel, and we'll get a little bit more into why we decided to go with 6.5 Creedmoor a little bit later on. But the barrel that we're using is from Fulton Armory, and we selected the Fulton Armory barrel because it is a really, really nice price point. Uh, this barrel uses a Criterion Blank, which is a button-forged and hand-lapped barrel. Uh, it's then turned down to Fulton Armory specs, and it is a DPMS spec barrel. Now, what that means is it has a DPMS receiver extension on here and is designed to accept DPMS pattern bolts and bolt carrier groups. One thing you want to be very, very careful of when you're selecting your components for a build like this is to make sure that you match your barrel 
and your bolt and bolt carrier group together. Now the nice thing with the Mega Arms Ma 10 receivers is they accept whichever pattern you decide to go for, either Armalite or DPMS slash Stoner slash SR25, but when you decide on which one you're gonna go with, you need to stick with that pattern for the operating assembly. So for here, we went with a 24 inch stainless steel barrel and Fulton Armory calls this a bull barrel. And in my opinion, it's not really a bull barrel. Usually when you think of bull barrels, you think same diameter from the chamber end all the way to the muzzle end. Uh, this is really just a little bit heavier than a Remington Varmint or Remington Sendero contour. Uh, it's got a little bit more weight to it, probably because back here at the chamber end, and then it doesn't quite taper down as severely as the Remington barrels, but it really it does not add as much weight as I was fearing when I saw a full bull barrel. It is threaded, so we can put our muzzle devices on here, and it does utilize a rifle length gas system. Now it's important that when you're starting to go further than 20 inches that you go with a rifle length gas system because it gives the bullet less distance once it passes the gas port before it leaves the barrel. This runs you less of a chance of the bolt trying to unlock while the bullet is still in the barrel. Uh, we are using higher pressure cartridges. We're using a lot of powder in these cartridges. And once the bullet passes that gas port, it's feeding gas back into the system to start the bolt carrier going backwards. Now the bolt may not actually unlock, but you may get enough pressure that that carrier is starting to move and things are starting to move inside the rifle before the bullet has left the barrel. So you really don't want to go with something like a 26 inch barrel and then a carbine length gas system, which I don't think anybody even makes because that bullet would still have a lot of travel and there would be a lot of pressure still in the barrel trying to force that bolt carrier group open before the bullet got out. So that's why we go with a rifle length gas system on a longer barrel like this. Now, as I mentioned, we went with a DPMS spec barrel, so we needed to go with a DPMS spec bolt carrier group. Now, in this case, we used a Fulton Armory bolt carrier group, but it is a DPMS type design. Uh, this one happens to be nickel boron coated, which should give us a little bit easier time scrubbing the carbon off of it and wiping it down, uh, but we'll see when we actually get into firing. It also should be a little bit slicker than the regular parkerized coating that you get on the standard DPMS bolt carrier groups. The added advantage of purchasing a Fulton Arms bolt carrier group when we purchase the Fulton Arms barrel is that Fulton Arms will actually check the headspace on the bolt with the barrel that you purchase. Now this isn't a massively big deal because we're going to check the headspace on it before we actually fire this rifle anyway, but for you guys out there that are really trying to do this on a budget, it saves you a little bit of money in not having to buy the headspace gauges because they should have already checked it and made sure that it is safe to fire. And if for some reason when they pulled this bolt out of the box and checked the headspace on it, if it didn't line up, then they can reject the bolt and just grab another one and put it in there. And you don't have to worry about trying to exchange things. And again, it saves you the cost of buying headspace gauges and it saves you the net necessity of totally stripping the bolt to be able to use those headspace gauges. So it is in your best interest, if you can, to try to purchase the bolt and barrel at the same place and ask them to headspace it before they send it out. Now, since we went with a little bit longer and a little bit heavier barrel out front, we need to balance that weight out at the rear of the rifle. And with the butt stock that we chose to use for this system, we went with the Magpul PRS butt stock. Now, the PRS is a little bit heavier than I like on smaller rifles. In fact, we actually pulled this stock off of the original Mega Arms Ma 10 build because that was a 16 inch lightweight barrel, and we've since replaced that with a collapsible stock. So we decided to go ahead and reuse this PRS on this build. Now, since it is a little bit of extra weight, it should help balance out the heavy forward barrel on this build. Uh, at least that's the hope. Now, the PRS stock is about a A1 length stock. Uh, it's a little bit shorter than your standard A2 stocks that you find on most AR-15s. It does utilize a standard rifle length receiver extension, and it's the same receiver extension no matter if we're going with a AR-15 or an AR-10. So it is a standard length 
no matter which platform we're going with. Now the advantages of the PRS, in addition to the weight that it's going to add to the back of the rifle, is we get an adjustable length of pull with these thumb wheels here, and adjustable comb, again, with a thumb wheel. So we can really set up this stock for our body and for our cheek. So if we run a higher optic system, we can crank the cheek piece up to get us where we need to be. We also have the option to remove this cover on the bottom and there's a Picatinny rail underneath here. So while most of the time we're going to be shooting it with the cover on, we have this nice flat portion here to ride on our rear bag. If we wanted to utilize a monopod, then we can just strip that cover off. We can attach a monopod and we're going to be good to go. So it gives you some nice options here. Now, to help control our gas system, we decided to go with an adjustable gas block on this rifle. Now, just like our previous build, we selected an SLR Rifle Works Sentry Adjustable Gas Block. The SLR Rifle Works gas blocks are really, really nice. They are click adjustable. So when you're turning the adjustment screw, which is located in the front of the gas block, you actually get audible and tactile clicks, much like you have with your scope turrets. The added advantage with these is that once you get it set to where you need it for your gas system to operate reliably, uh, you can then turn it all the way down, counting the clicks as you go until it bottoms out. And then you know exactly where your settings are. You can go log that down in your data book so that if you run into a situation later on where you need to monkey with it or play around with it, then you know exactly where it was. Also, if you happen to run a suppressor sometimes and not, at other times, then you can count the clicks between your suppressed and unsuppressed adjustments and you can dial it in uh, back and forth however you want to go. It also negates the need for Loctite, so you have an actual detent holding that screw in place. You don't have to worry about it walking when it heats up and cools down. So it's a very, very nice, well-machined part. Uh, this is a clamp-on gas block because as you notice, the gas block seat on this barrel is perfectly smooth. We don't have any divots for set screws. Uh, we don't have any uh, cross-drilled slots for pins. So we're using a clamp-on gas block that will not induce any kind of stress into our barrel here. Now, if we wanted to, if we wanted to use set screws, then we need to have divots machined in here so that those set screws can index and we don't have to worry about the gas block walking. Uh, that shouldn't be a problem once we get this gas block on and we get the actual mounting screws loctited in. We should be good to go. And again, this is a competition oriented rifle. I would never do this on a hard use duty rifle uh, because then the gas block is going to be exposed with our rifle length forend and we could crack that gas block against something and get it tilted to one side or the other. If you're going to do something like this with a clamp-on type gas block, then you want to make sure that you buy an extended rail system so that it covers that gas block. Uh, we decided to go with the rifle length over the extended length just because we're trying to shave a little bit of weight off that forend. We already knew we were going to have a fairly heavy barrel hanging out there. So in our application, it really shouldn't be an issue. Lastly, for the fire control group, we decided to select a Geissele high speed trigger. We've used Geissele triggers in the past. They are a very, very high quality product. Now, when we originally shot pictures of the components that we were gonna use and we posted them on our Facebook page, a lot of you guys asked why we went with the high speed trigger instead of the SSA or SSA E trigger. Well, we used the SSA E trigger in our last build because again, that was a hard use type rifle. It was a DM type rifle. So we wanted a trigger that a, say a police officer would be at home using on his rifle. We didn't want adjustments that could back out or change and we didn't want anything that uh, could be altered in an unauthorized manner on a service type rifle. Well, since this rifle is more of a match rifle, then we do want that adjustability. We want to be able to dial in this trigger so that the specific shooter has exactly the trigger that they want. And the high speed gives us that ability. Now, the high speed comes in several different flavors. It comes in a match rifle flavor, which is the lightest pull weight. It comes in a DMR type, which is an intermediate pull weight. And then it comes with the service rifle, 
uh, design, which is the heaviest of the pole weights, and it's designed to be legal in NRA service rifle competition. Now the neat thing is the difference between each of those three triggers is just simply the springs that the trigger ships with. So you can request that Geissele includes each one of those springs and you can mix and match and get it tuned in the way you want the trigger to feel. It also has several internal adjustments including over travel and it has uh, sear engagement as well. So when we get into installing this trigger in the lower we can get it dialed in for our lower and get it tuned exactly the way we want it. So it is a very nice product. We're really looking forward to getting that installed. And we want to thank Geisley for sending that out. That is a broad overview of the parts that we are going to use going forward on this build. Now you notice it is not an inclusive list. There were some parts that we left out because we kind of want to have at least a little bit of a surprise as we go along and as we put this thing together. Uh, there really are some things that you need to make sure you watch out for when you build a large frame AR versus a small frame AR. There are some parts that are not compatible uh, across the two even though they look like they might fit and cause you some serious problems later on. So make sure as we go through this you guys are paying attention and we will point out what components will not work cross-platform and what components will. So hopefully you'll join us for that. That's all we have for this first overview installment. Uh, the next video we are going to get into putting our lower receiver together and installing our Geissele high speed trigger into that. So make sure you stay tuned for that. If you guys have any questions or comments about any of the parts that we've discussed here or any of the reasons for the parts that we've decided to use for this build, please put your question in the comment section below or send it to us on Facebook or Twitter. If you've liked this video, please make sure you like, share, and subscribe, and please stick with us for future episodes. Until next time, get out and shoot!